Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so I am Dr. Bardita Dash, of consultant ophthalmologist at Dr. Agarwal Sai Hospital, Kukatpalli, and I will be your moderator for today's session. So today we are going to have an informative webinar on refractive surgery procedures. So before we dive into the exciting world where you can live without spectacles, let me introduce you to uh, introduce you to our esteemed speaker. He is a renowned expert in ophthalmology. Currently working as clinical head at Dr. Agarwal Sai Hospital, Kukatpalli, Dr. Shesha Jalam Nitin has dedicated 17 years of his career in improving vision and quality of life for countless number of his patients. He is an expert in wide range of refractive surgery procedures like PRK, last six smile, intraocular lens implantations. And today we are going to learn about all these procedures from Dr. Nitin in a while. Throughout this webinar, you can also ask us your doubts and post your questions in the chat box. After this, this webinar, we have one question and answer session where we will be answering all your doubts. So let us start. I welcome Dr. Nitin. Thank you for joining us today. This virtual stage is all yours. You can start, sir. Thank you so much for the kind words, uh, Varnita. A uh, very warm welcome to everybody who's taken the time to join us today uh, to understand a bit about what modern techniques and refractive surgeries are. Uh, and uh, so let's begin without delay. Let me get a thing. He's logged in today. Uh, as uh, Parnita has introduced, we'll try and understand uh, what options we have in today's world to get rid of our eyeglasses or uh, uh, refractive errors that we have. Before we get this, let's understand uh, the overview of what we'll go through today. We'll have a brief introduction about the different types of refractive errors. Let's understand what they are. Uh, and then we'll try and talk about the different procedures that we have to get uh, free from these refractive errors. Uh, a little understanding about uh, which patient is an ideal candidate for a refractive surgery, the benefits of each of those procedures, little drawbacks if there are any. And uh, at the end of it, uh, I'll try and answer as many questions that you have as possible here. Right. Now, imagine a world where you wake up each morning and you don't have to reach out for that pair of glasses at your, at your bedside table. Imagine a world where you can go out to the gym or you can go out, to, uh, go out on a hike or go out uh, doing all your adventure activities that you like without having to depend on a frame on top of your nose or contact lenses placed inside your eye. Uh, refractive procedures make this kind of life a reality. Uh, today, we'll delve into the different common types of refractive errors, as I said and uh, the various types of refractive surgeries available, their benefits, and also a little bit about what the future can hold in this very exciting field for us. Now, coming to what is a refractive error. A refractive error is a common vision problem where the eye cannot focus light very sharply onto the retina, and therefore uh, images feel a little blurred for uh, the person who has this kind of a refractive error. It affects different all, all kinds of age groups. The most common type of refractive error that we have is called myopia or nearsightedness. Uh, this is what most of you will have as a minus power with, uh, uh, with you guys uh, in, your, in your spectacle correction. Uh, what happens in myopia is the optical apparatus of your eye, which is the cornea and the lens, the focusing apparatus of your eye, is a little overpowered and it tends to focus light, which is a little short of the retina or the sensory layer of the eye. It can also happen if your eyeball is a little normal than usual. This is the most common type of refractive error that is prevalent. The opposite of myopia is known as hyperopia. Here what happens is uh, the optical apparatus is a little weak and therefore the light that uh, uh, the focus point is not on the sensory layer again and falls behind it. And therefore things that are uh, far away might be clear, but things that are near become very difficult to see. 
as is the opposite of myopia, where myopia with people with minus power, they can see things which are near very clearly, but things from far seems very blurred. In people with hyper hyperopia or hypermetropia or people who have a plus power, things from far are clear, but things from near become very difficult to see. The third type of refractive error is known as astigmatism, where light focuses on two different parts of the retina, and therefore that leads to a little bit of a blurred image. This is the kind of power that you have as a cylindrical power in your eye, uh, usually mentioned with certain degrees, but ranging between 0 to 180 degrees. So these are the three most common types of refractive errors that uh, people in the younger age group have to deal with. Uh, the fourth type is known as presbyopia, and this is something that everybody has to go through. This is an age-related change that happens within the eye, and there's an age-related difficulty in focusing on near objects. So this usually happens after the age of 40, and you must have seen people wearing their reading glasses after 40, 42, that's usually the time. Or people starting to hold things a little far from their uh, from your eyes so that they'll be able to see that clearly. That condition is known as presbyopia. So these are the four basic types of refractive errors. Now, what are the options we have to get rid of these kind of uh, the, these uh, spectacles? So the different options, uh, I'll just list them here. We'll talk about them in detail later. The first is PRK and the second trans PRK. More or, so, more or less the same, but I'll, we'll get into that. PRK is photorefractive keratectomy. Uh, LASIK, which is laser-resisted in-situ keratomy induces. SMILE, which is a small incision lenticule extraction. These four are laser vision corrections, where we use a laser to basically modify the cornea. Now, the cornea is the uh, what we call uh, the front part of the eye, the colored dark part of your eye. It's actually a transparent structure in the front of the eye, which gets its color from the tissues inside your eye. So we use laser to kind of modify by a few microns, the, uh, the based on how much power you have. So uh, we kind of modify this this cornea so that the light then can get focused onto the retina and you're able to see. The fifth option is known as an ICL or an implantable polymer lens. This is useful for people who are not suitable for any kind of uh, laser vision corrections. And we'll come into that when we talk about that. Right? Coming to the first procedure, which is known as PRK or photorefractive keratect. Here, what we do, very simply put, is we work on the topmost layer of the eye, the, uh, of the eye, which is the cornea. The cornea has around five layers. The topmost layer, which is known as the epithelium, is uh, first removed using a uh, specific solution placed on the eye. No blade is used here. It's just wiped off the eye. Then a laser is used to remold the cornea. And then a bandage contact lens is placed on top of the eye so that the top layer, which has been removed, is allowed to heal. This uh, usually heals at around three to four days, during which duration the bandage contact lens is in place. PRK is a very good procedure in the sense that it helps us to work with even thinner corneas and corneas, uh, which might be slightly weaker based on our assessment. Uh, it has been there for a long, long time. Uh, it's, we've been doing PRKs for almost 30 years. We use something called an eczema laser here. Uh, this is a procedure that's also done for people who need to get into a kind of a lot of physical activities, like people who need to get into uh, probably the, uh, the armed forces or police work or people who are sports people who might get into, uh, who have a heavy kind of physical activity. PRK works very well for them. Trans PRK, also known as trans epithelial PRK, is a complete laser procedure. It is a PRK where instead of using a solution to remove the top layer of the eye, uh, the top layer, which is the epithelium of the cornea, we use a laser to do the same thing. We'll try and see if this uh, video works for you. Uh, we'll try and sh I'll try and show you a brief video uh, overview of the videos at the end, if possible. Right now, coming to LASIK. LASIK is one of the most commonly heard about terms. It has been uh, uh, in vogue for again the past 25 to 30 years. Keratomuleuses. So here what we do, again, an eczema laser is used to remold the cornea, as in the step three as is shown here. The difference from PRK is that here we use a laser to kind of create a flap on the cornea. We don't remove the topmost layer. Here the top two, two and a half layers are kind of split up and the cornea is opened up like the page of a book. So this is called a flap. 
So once the flap is removed, a laser is done to again remold the cornea. Once that is done, the, the, the surface is washed and the flap is then replaced back onto the cornea. The advantage of LASIK as compared to PRK, it has a faster recovery, probably a little bit of irritation for a couple of hours on the day of the procedure. From, but from the next day onwards, your vision is very clear because the epithelium is not disturbed. Uh, so it's a relatively painless procedure with a quick recovery time. However, in these days, we've been doing very little LASIK because we now have uh, a new uh, option that is much more better because it, as, let me just understand this area of the flap. So as I talk about smile and understand how that becomes a little more advantageous. That is the third option that we have, which is smile, which is small incision lenticule extraction. Here, again, the amount of tissue, this is a completely all laser procedure. There's no eczema laser use. There's no splitting of the cornea or no lifting of the flap that is done. Here, whatever tissue that needs to be removed or remolded is kind of, uh, we use a femtosecond laser, which is a more modern laser here, or a nanosecond laser. We create a little lenticule in the eye, like a disc within the eye. That is the area that needs to be flattened. And through a small little opening, which is like 2.5 to 3 millimeters, that tissue is then taken out. So this is where that small incision comes in. So the advantage is because we are not actually splitting or lifting up the flap, a lesser area of the cornea is disturbed. And therefore, this leads to a much more stable cornea, uh, very little uh, side effects, uh, a more stable refraction, and a very, very fast recovery. So SMILE is one of the most modern techniques we have. Uh, and uh, this is our go-to procedure in most cases that wherever this is suitable, right? Again, let's try and see if this works for us, but uh, yeah, that's fine. Coming now to the last option, this is now a surgical option, which is called an ICL or an implantable polymer lens. Now, laser vision correction that I talked about, that is PRK or trans-PRK, basic or smile. All these techniques involve, as I said, remolding the cornea, remolding the cornea or flattening the cornea so that your cornea now focuses light onto the retina. Uh, certain cases are there, certain individuals whose corneas are a bit too thin, they're not strong enough for us to do any kind of laser on them because uh, then long-term stability and long-term vision safety becomes an issue. Here, ICL comes into the picture. ICL is a surgical procedure where through a small little keyhole, this little, little lens here, which is as thin as a contact lens, is placed into your eye between the cornea and your lens. Now, uh, this is specifically designed by taking measurements of your eye. Putting that lens in takes around 5 to 10 minutes. It's a very safe and effective procedure for people who are not suitable for laser vision corrections. So, who are the people who are eligible? for these kind of refractive surgery option. Age, the first criteria that we look at, you need to have completed a minimum of 18 years of age. What is more important is a stable vision or a stable refractive error. If your refractive error has not changed by more than 0.5 since the past six months and you're above 18 years of age, you become an eligible candidate for a laser vision correction or a refractive procedure, let's call it that. But eligibility is different from suitability. So if you're eligible, what do a scan or a pre-assessment in our clinics where we and where we try and uh, assess the strength of the cornea by through its corneal thickness and, and uh, the shape of the cornea. We have one of the best machines, uh, which is called a shine plug uh, imaging. Uh, uh, Machine Dr. Nikin, your voice is breaking a bit. Hello, sorry. Your voice can was you breaking. Is it? Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. Sorry, the internet connection was a little unstable. Am I, am I clear now? Yeah, yeah, you, you are, you are. Yeah. Yes. So now we, we make an assessment and then try and choose which of these different options that I talked about is suitable for uh, each individual person. How long does the procedure take? It's a relatively quick uh, outpatient uh, procedure. It takes usually around 10 to 15 minutes to do both the eyes. Both the eyes are done on the same day. The patient uh, walks in out uh, your operation theater and walks out of it. Uh, uh, and uh, recovery times with the LASIK and smile, you can get back to your uh, suppose computer or work or whatever within two or three days with prk maybe you might require a little longer time or up to one week 
for you to get back to work. <clears throat> Preoperatively, as I said, we do a complete evaluation. You need to stop, if you're wearing soft contact lenses, you need to stop them for at least a week before we get any kind of uh, procedure done. Postoperatively, as I said, rest and recovery is very important. Uh, drops will be prescribed to you. We'll be given protective eyeglasses to be worn. Usually, these need to be worn for a maximum of around uh, uh, one week after the procedure. We ask you to avoid washing your face for three days and avoid washing your hair, getting a head bath for around five days. Limit screen time and reading. Again, as I said, uh, if it is mild or LASIK that you're getting it done, you can get back to your screen in a couple of days. If it is PRK, up to around one week. So these are the different refractive options that we have. It gives you visual freedom and convenience. These are quick, it, is, it, it has a quick recovery. These are cost effective. And the whole idea is that you can live a life which is independent from the spectacles or contact lenses. So thank you so much, all of you, uh, for logging in to this webinar. We'll probably try and answer uh, if uh, but if we have any questions that are there, we'll probably try and get this. Uh, uh, Hello. We'll try and answer whatever questions available. For further questions, you can always uh, log in to, uh, sorry, you can email that particular email that the screen is showing, or you can call the number that's there on your screen right now. Right? Thank you so much. And I hope you can inaugurate a life free of glasses soon. Uh, thank thank you, Dr. Nitin, for this wonderful presentation. I hope you have cleared all the doubts. Uh, I will see if I have any questions. So, yeah. Somebody wants to know if the procedure is painful. Uh, yeah, the one thing I tell all my patients is if uh, the procedure is painful to you, you can pinch me back when you go out because I'm confident enough that the procedure is not painful. Uh, we use numbing eye drops. We have no injections to be given. So we'll uh, we use anesthetic eye drops, which will lump your eye for the period of time that we have to do the procedure. So it's a completely painless procedure. Yes, with PRK, which is the first option that I discussed where the epithelium is removed and we put in a bandage contact lens for the epithelium to heal. There will be discomfort, there will be light sensitivity, pain and a little bit of watering for at least two to three days after the procedure is done. Still that top layer of your eye heals. After the third or fourth day, usually most people are pain free. So, uh, so they're asking if it is a one time procedure. I mean, yeah. Repeat yes. surgeries, they're asking. Yeah. Regarding repeat surgeries, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, a very good question. Very good question. Whoever is asking, can do you have the names of people who are asking this? We have few, sir. Do you get the name? No. We are getting few. Like, right. Okay, uh, anyway. Yeah. But that's a very good question. Right. It's a very good question about repeat procedures. You have to understand that refractive surgery is a one-time procedure for your life in the sense that we are, we, as I said, we need to wait for your refractive error to stabilize. You have to be in the right age group. So whatever power you have, say you have a minus three or a minus four, you're creating that and you don't get that power back again. However, like in life, there are no absolute guarantees in anything. There are certain people where they might have certain amount of what we call regression or a return of power that happens probably one in 500. And in such cases, we might have to do retreatments if required. I hope that answers this question. But yeah, otherwise, the does. treatment is for life. This treatment is so that you are not dependent on the spectacles that you wear uh, for life. Okay, we have one question. So the person is telling he is suffering from dry ice problem. So, am I eligible for refractive surgery? That is the question. If yes, somebody is having dry eye, so if that person is eligible for the refractive surgery procedure. Yes, another very good question. Uh, if you've already been diagnosed with dry eye, uh, again, I don't have your name. Let's call you anonymous. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is some iPhone, actually. There is no so, name, yeah. So, Mr. So Mr. iPhone, if you have been diagnosed as... Uh, 
uh, as a patient with dry eye, probably they've done a testing where they've actually measured your uh, amount of tear production from your eye. Or if you're assuming it's a dry eye because your eyes feel a little heavy or, or you have that burning or gritty sensation, we, in all cases of refractive surgeries and all laser vision corrections, we first do a dry eye evaluation. We first measure the amount of tears being produced in the eye. We try and assess the quality of your tear film. And if there is dry eye, we try and correct that before we can go in for refractive surgeries. One thing you have to understand in laser vision corrections that the first the, the first three that I talked about PRK, LASIK, and SMILE, all of them uniformly will cause an increase in dryness in the eye. Uh, when it comes to PRK and LASIK, the older techniques which use excimer laser, the dryness is longer; it is much more. Where it you you will have to use artificial tears for at least uh, six months, if not up to one year. Whereas for smile, because it is a smaller incision, the corneal nerve endings are less disturbed and dryness doesn't usually last for more than a couple of months. So uh, in so we choose based on how your tear film quality is, what would be the right procedure for you. But yes, if it is a severe dry eye, we need to first treat that and then probably go in for a refractive correction. Okay, so the next question is from Yogandar, if I'm right. So he's asking if the process is 100% successful. So, part of which you have answered already, I think. So, part of which you have answered. Yes, Mr. Yogan. Yes. No, unfortunately, there's no such thing as 100% anywhere in life. It's a bit like crossing the road. That's what I tell all my patients. It's a bit like crossing the road. Uh, there's no 100% guarantee you'll get to the other end. But there's a 99.99% chance that you'll get there. Uh, whatever risks are there, if we find certain things in our pre-evaluation, we try and discuss that uh, completely with the patient. Uh, I... Uh, by 100%, there are two things that a person can be. One could be whether the complete power goes, right? Uh, or will the power never come back again? Now, coming to the first part, whether that uh, power completely is taken off. Now, we target emetropia. You have to understand that there's no such thing as zero in ophthalmology. No no person in this, uh, in this world ever has a zero power. If you check people who are not using glasses also and you actually put them in evaluation, you might find that they might have a small power of around plus or minus 0.5. Now, similarly, when we do a refractive correction, we target emetropia so that you're not dependent on spectacles. That we are doing this procedure on a tissue that has life. It's a living tissue. It's not a piece of glass where you put in a scratch and that scratch remains. We put it on a, it's, it's a living tissue where there will be a biological response. So this response is usually within plus or minus 0.5 and you're not dependent on your spectacles. I hope I was clear. Was that clear? Between the end of summer, but I think it was clear, yeah. We yes. could hear it, yeah. So shall I go for the next question, sir? Yeah, please, please. So, Subramaniam is asking if somebody has uh, undergone one PRK or LASIK and then mm. he is above 40 now. Mm. So, does he does he need to use glasses? I think he is, he is meaning that presbyopic near glasses. Presbyopic. That is what he is. Very good, yeah. very good, very good question, Subramaniam. Uh, you have to understand that when you talk, like when I talked about the different types of refractive errors, the first three that I talked about, which is myopia, hyperopia, and astigmatism. These are the powers that people are usually, uh, they usually develop in their younger age through their school and college life, and they're dependent on the spectacles for throughout their life. This doesn't happen in all cases, but certain people. So people with refractive, people who need refractive correction are these group of people. Coming to have uh, the requirement for reading glasses in later life after the age of 40, that is an age-related con age -related condition that everybody has to go through. So whether you have refractive correction, whether you had glasses in your school or college, uh, or you never wore glasses ever in your life, when you get close to that age, your eye ages like every other part of your body. The muscles within the eye become weak. The elasticity of the structures becomes a little less. And that's why we tend to develop uh, near near objects tend to get a little out of focus, which is why you tend to need reading glasses. So yes, even if you've got a laser correction done, for your permanent glasses that you needed, that you had before, uh, you will still require reading glasses after the age of, usually after the age of 42 to 43. I hope that answers so, your question. Yes. So next, Mr. Rao is asking, 
Uh, so if cataract surgery is done, hmm. so after cataract surgery, whether some uh, classic or something is possible or not? That is his uh, question. Yeah, Mr. Rao. Yeah, that's a very good question, actually, Mr. Rao. Now, it depends on uh, the kind of intraocular lens that is placed in your eye uh, when you uh, underwent the cataract surgery. Now, one of the methods of correcting glasses that we've not mentioned here, because that would probably take it beyond the realm of our discussion of laser corrections, is uh, cataract surgery itself. Cataract surgery uh, with the modern lenses and the modern intraocular lenses that we have as surgeons in front of our, uh, at our disposal, that itself has become a refractive surgery where we can correct glass powers both for far and distance with the intraocular lens that has been that has to be implanted into the eye, where we have different types of trifocals, multifocals, or extended depth of focus intraocular lenses that can correct uh, various types of powers uh, within the eye. Now, suppose you've already got a correction done and it was a monofocal lens, then you will still have to depend on glasses for your reading purpose. I hope that answers your question. So they're asking whether LASIK surgery can be done or not after cataract surgery. I think that was the question. LASIK surgery can be done after cataract surgery. Yeah. In case, uh, like, uh, I, I, I hope I, let's put it this way. In the case, like, if you've uh, undergone a cataract as a refractive procedure, let's say that way, where you you thought about getting rid, even after a cataract surgery, you have a lot, usually with a cataract surgery, you won't have any power remaining for distance unless it's around 0 0.5, 0 0.75 again, which is very mild. But if it is very significant, it's two and above, then yes, we can do laser corrections to correct those powers. So Mr. Rao has one more question, which I can answer, I think. He's asking, yes. where can he meet you? <laughs> So, yeah, Mr. Rao, you can come to Dr. Agarwal Sai Hospital, Kukatpoli branch. Dr. Nitin is available from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. here. You can either get an appointment or just come walk in. So, yeah, so next question is from Manjushri. She's asking which type of surgery is highly suggestible? Yes, it's like... Uh... Again, uh, a very common uh, question, Manjushri. Uh, it's a good doubt to have. What would, uh, if, uh, let's put it this way, uh, there are certain procedures which would be suitable for certain individuals based on uh, what their power is, based on how thick their cornea is, based on how the cornea is shaped. Or, let's say how, this, how strong the cornea is. Uh, and uh, what uh, based on that, we need to choose what is an ideal procedure for them. But having said that, if all the different types of procedures are suitable for a person, if I had to choose, I would choose smile for a particular person because of its obvious advantages, small incision, uh, faster recovery, a more stable and strong cornea, fewer side effects. So smile. Okay. So another question is from Manjushi. A very nice question, sir. So she's asking... Uh, for all the types of surgery, I mm. mean, she means to say, I think, which for which power, which surgery should be done. That is what she wants to know. Yeah, I wish it was that easy. Then we wouldn't need surgeons <laughs> to be here at all, Manisha. <laughs> because uh, the point here is, uh, as a surgeon, and we have to answer one more point. That's a very good point that can, we can answer to this. Laser surgeries are, frankly, a lot of the work is done by the machine itself. These are very high-end machines with very precise lasers that can correct a refractive error to a T. So the actual surgical work uh, is not much. Uh, there's a little bit of skill involved, but the greater skill is in selecting the right procedure for the right individual. And that is where knowledge and study comes in, where we need to assess your cornea and need to assess, as I said again, it's multifactorial. It's not like you have, there are certain cases where we cannot even correct minus two. And there are certain cases where we can correct minus 20 also. So it's not about how much power you have. It's about the overall picture about what the power is, what your age group is, how strong your cornea is, and what your expectation generally is from refractive cell. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So Mohammed is asking if the surgeries are applicable to uh, like more than 31 years of age. If we ah, can go for the surgery. Mohammed, 31 is very young here, definitely. So, uh, Arvind is asking I, about ICL procedure. Like, what is yes. that procedure? I uh, Yeah, I spoke briefly about it, uh, Arvind. 
ICL, as I said, stands for implantable columnar lens or call it a permanent contact lens where a specially designed lens is placed into your eye. Now, laser corrections are done on the cornea, which is the black circle or it's actually a transparent stru uh, structure in front of the eye. But where we cannot do any procedure on the cornea, we put in a permanent contact lens into the eye through a small little keyhole. So uh, that is an ICL procedure. Uh, we need to take measurements and these measurements are sent to the company. Uh, which then designs that lens for you. Once the lens is here, we then put that into your eye. That It takes me around five minutes to do an ICL procedure. We do one eye at a time. Recovery, again, ICL has its own advantages because, uh, again, one of my, it, it was not smile, my second favorite procedure is always an ICL. Uh, because, uh, one, with an ICL, we do not change the God-given eye. Uh, we do not uh, thin out or flatten out your cornea. Your cornea, as is God given, remains the same. We are putting something into your eye, so we are not taking something out. So that makes it a little safer. Uh, we are not touching the cornea, so there's no dryness. So this also kind of brings me back to the first question about people who had a dry eye and whether they can get procedure done. People who have a dry eye, we always think about putting an ICL rather than going for a laser vision correction. Again, because ICL does not cause any dryness after you put it. Also, another big advantage with an ICL is because you're putting it into the eye, it is close to what we call the nodal point of the eye. So certain patients have also reported uh, an improvement in vision. Like suppose they were able to see only five out of six lines. After the procedure, they're even able to see a part of the sixth line, which uh, is another advantage of ICL. So Chansey is asking, uh, she has undergone surgery already 14 years ago. Yeah. Yes. So she is she is now suffering from myopia again. So she is fifty one. So she is asking hmm. whether she is eligible for further surgery or. That is her question. Yes, Jansi. I mean, uh, uh, for different people in different age groups, we need to assess because if you are fifty plus, it brings you very close to an age where uh, uh, so your voice is big. So rather than looking at operating your cornea. Dr. Nitin, your voice is breaking. Yeah. yeah, there's a little unstable connection. I'm yes, yes. I'm not I'm not speaking right now. Is, is it okay now? Yeah, it is fine now. Yes. Hello. Yes, it is fine now. Yeah, it is fine now, Dr. Hello? Yes, I can I can hear you, Varnita, but yeah, can yeah. I speak? I mean, is the yeah, voice... Yeah, yeah, now, now it is fine. Yes. yes. Right, yeah. Janji, it's a very good question because it brings us to a point about uh, we can think about what... Uh, see, now, probably in the earlier... Uh, phases would have said like we'd stop doing any kind of laser vision corrections or removal of glasses after a certain particular age. But now we look at the different ways by which we can uh, remove glasses. If you're above 50, uh, more than operating on the lens and talking about all the techniques that I've talked about, the SMILE, ICL, PRK and all these techniques, we can think about doing a lens-based procedure where we do a clear lens extraction. And we use a multitude of intraocular lens options out there, which is a permanent treatment. Because uh, one thing is there, people who got LASIK surgery done, because of age-related changes, they will have a cataract in their later age group after the age of 60. Now, if you are 51, uh, the best option for you could probably be a lens-based procedure. Of course, we need an evaluation to understand which kind of lens we can put into your eye. And that will be a permanent treatment, and you won't have cataracts later on in life. Uh, I think, Varnita, your thing is on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. So, Kanishka is asking, uh, my power is still increasing gradually. So, shall I go for the surgery? You have already answered that in your... I answered that question, Kanishka. It depends on your age. I mean, if you're, if you're above 18, say you're above 21, and your power is still increasing, then you need to get yourself evaluated because we need to evaluate your retina and understand whether there's uh, the certain conditions that we need to look out for. So, if it's still not stabilized even after 21... Uh, Please do go come in for a checkup or visit your uh, nearby specialist. 
So Kavya is asking whether both eyes can be treated at the same time. So, hello? yes, Kavya, we answered that both eyes are treated. Yes, hello. Yes, I could yeah. hear that. Kavya, we, we, do, we do treat both eyes at the same time. Both eyes, as I said, uh, the refractive surgery takes around 10 to 15 minutes. Both eyes are uh, treated at the same time. You walk in and you walk out of the operation theater. Uh, unless it's an ICL where we do one eye at a time, we do that. Uh, we do one eye in one day and do the other eye on the next day. That's the only difference. So, Ms. Ramadevi is asking, in case of retinal degeneration, hmm. whether this kind of surgery is still help or not? Yes, uh, uh, Rama, we do as one other part of our evaluation before we do any kind of refractive procedure is we do a complete evaluation of the retina. And if there are any weak spots in the retina, they need to be treated first before we can uh, go in for any refractive surgery. So retinal degeneration in the sense, now that, that it's a very broad term, now what kind of degeneration you're talking about is very difficult to assess. But in a normal younger patient, if you're assessing for any kind of weak spots within the retina, we need to treat them first before we any so, Mr. Guru Prashad is asking about the cost. Uh, yeah, that's the I don't charge any money. The the people who charge the money will tell you about the cost. But uh, yeah, but generally, let's say uh, have different options available, uh, and uh, there are low cost options and uh, there are expensive options too. So, price should not be a factor for you to hold back. Uh, from getting rid of your glasses because there are uh, less expensive options also, Mr. Guru Prasad. That's all I can say. But you need to be suitable for those less uh, expensive options. So that's something that we can probably evaluate and then tell you. Okay, so we have next uh, in a person with astigmatism and myopia, mm. if smile can be mm. done, done. So that is the question they're asking. Kanisha. Yeah, so Kanisha, Kanisha. Kanisha. Kanisha, it's a very, yeah, very technical question. Uh, there is a uh, smile uh, has been approved within India. I mean, there is a certain thing about a certain amount of astigmatism uh, could not be corrected with smile in, during the earlier phases. But now we even go up to astigmatism up to minus three cylinders and patients are quite happy even after smile. But if a cylinder or astigmatism is much more uh, or if it's only astigmatism that we need to correct, then I would probably look at other options to probably correct you. Depend again on all multiple factors, I would probably choose a LASIK or think about a toric ICR or something or a PR. Okay, so Raju is asking uh, if somebody has been treated for myopia and then he is having hypermetropy, I think he wants to mean, then what to do? So that is again the same question, I think. No, hyperopia, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hyperopia. Hyperopia. Yeah, yeah. hyperopia. But so, hyperopia is rare. Yes. Uh, and most of these corrections work very well for minus pass uh, or to a certain small degrees of hyperopia. But if it is a large plus power that you have, then we again look at rather than working on the cornea because that much tissue is not there in the cornea for us to be able to correct a uh, large plus power. We look at then working on the lens where we can uh, do a clear lens extraction and use the intraocular lens to correct your part. So yes, uh, there are options for everybody, but which option is going to suit you is uh, dependent again about uh, on, on the evaluation that we have to do. Uh, Mrs. Bhanushri is asking, she is 72. So whether okay. she can get a smile or lasik? I mean, uh, you can get a smile from me, Bhanushri Garu. <laughs> Uh, that's a smile you can get, but I can get rid of your glasses by working on your lens. I think a cataract surgery is the best way. Okay, so, so uh, Mr. Kumar Reddy is asking, I'm 26, my power is minus 2.5. So, which surgery would you suggest for me? Again, as I said, it's, uh, it's not always about the power. Uh, we can... Uh, as I said, sometimes we cannot correct even minus 2 and sometimes we can correct even minus 20. So it's not the magnitude of power. That's only one of the points that we look at. If your cornea is suitable for all different types of procedure, let's say, assuming that uh, everything is fine and all the different types of procedures are suitable for you, I would go for smile. So next, Satish is asking, 8 years old boy, if you can do LASIK. 
That is the question. No, that's the first question answer. I mean, age minimum. Yes, you, you have answered all. Yeah, you need to complete eighteen years of age. Uh, at at that age, understand that if it's a child you're talking about, it's very important that they wear their glasses. Eight years, the first ten years of life, it's very very important for the connections between the eye and the brain to develop. Uh, a regular checkup once every six months is what we recommend. And every time there's a change of glasses, you need to keep changing them. And once it stabilizes, then we can look at options after the age of eighteen. Uh, so okay. So uh, okay, we answered this. Have you answered most questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. One more question is: uh, My daughter is fourteen, and okay. her power is minus ten. Okay. This uh, Mr. Mahesh is saying we want to meet you. So we have told that uh, before also. He is available. Yeah. At, yeah. Yeah. So he wants to meet you. That Hello, is Mahesh. You can visit. You can visit us at. Uh, 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 your hospital. Okay, so we have one more question. So, uh, for patients above 50 with refractive errors, hmm. so would you suggest a cataract or over and smile or something like that? Which one do you suggest? I usually suggest, as I said, once you're 50 and above, I would rather go for a lens based procedure that is a cataract surgery rather than going for a smile. Because what happens is, it's not that we cannot do a smile in that age group. We can do. If you're really concerned about, you know, getting your natural lens removed and uh, putting something into your eye. If you're more happy getting just a safer, just on the eye procedure, then we can do. It's not, age is not the bar here. But the point becomes that if we do a refractive surgery at the age of 50 and then 10 years later, we develop a cataract and then again, I have to operate. I'd rather do a procedure once and correct a refractive error for the rest of your life, which can be done through a lens-based procedure. So that would be a better option. Then. Okay. So, okay, we'll stop with these questions. Yeah. Uh, if okay. possible, can you put this slide? They're asking about the email ID and phone number. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just share people that are yeah. Yes, yes. I'll just share that slide once more. Yeah. Yeah. So, So I hope we have answered all your doubts. If you have any further queries, please write to us in this email ID. You can even call in this number also. It is in your screen now. Please note it down. We'll be happy to answer all your questions. So finally, I thank Dr. Nitin for his insightful presentation and also for sharing his expertise with us today. I thank all the audience who has uh, joined the webinar today and made it successful. So stay safe, stay informed, and stay connected with us in our website and also uh, in social media platform. You can always get many interesting information and also tips so that you can live a life with quality and clarity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you. Thank you also. Thank you, Bernita.